All right, what's going on, you guys? Nick here with Nick's Time Power. So I thought an interesting topic for a video would be how much muscle is too much muscle, specifically pertaining to professional bodybuilding. Obviously, you know, it's been getting to a point where the physiques have been getting bigger and bigger over the years. Um, and the standard for how much muscle a bodybuilder has as a pro bodybuilder um, and gets rewarded for has been constantly increasing, especially recently with a guy like Big Rami. Now, a couple of months ago, I was hanging out with another YouTuber, Alan Roberts, uh, from Every Damn Day Fitness YouTube channel. You guys might be familiar with him. Um, and we were hanging out and we were talking about bodybuilders specifically. We were talking about Big Rami. And we were talking about when, you know, the size game in bodybuilding is going to reach its breaking point and when that, you know, mass monster bubble is really going to burst. And we both kind of agreed it seems to be that Big Rami might really be the breaking point. Um, for how much muscle is too much muscle and how big is too big on a bodybuilding stage. Now, obviously, Big Rami went from placing second at the 2017 Mr. Olympia to dropping down to sixth at the 2018 Mr. Olympia. So I think the general consensus on that is that Big Rami needed to come in condition. We've talked about this ad nauseum, um, that Big Rami really needs to nail that conditioning and stop focusing on size. I think the fans really, you know, had a tremendous part in the outcry for that. Um, I think the judges finally realized that this year, and that's why Big Rami placed where he did. He wasn't really listening to, you don't need to play the size game anymore. You don't need to be any bigger. Um, he was talking about being, you know, well over 300 pounds just one day out from the Olympia. And then, of course, Sean Roden, you know, one of the more aesthetic bodybuilders to win the Mr. Olympia in the past, you know, probably 20 years, um, really, you know, kind of setting a new standard for what it means to be Mr. Olympia. Generally, I think it's a really interesting topic of conversation that, you know, right now, I think we're really experiencing the top end of the mass monster era. I think the mass monster era has reached its peak and now it's going on a decline and focusing back on aesthetics, um, lines and classic physiques and really going back down towards a more, you know, streamlined look and not so much, you know, the freaky mass monster. And one of the things that Alan and I were talking about that really, you know, stuck out to me um, was when we were talking about Big Rami in the off season, weighing over 350 pounds, I think, you know, close to 360 in some cases. We were talking about how having that much muscle on your body, carrying around that much extra muscle is just as unhealthy as a guy that weighed 350 pounds and is carrying around, you know, that equal amount of fat. Just having that excess amount of tissue on your body, the strain that it puts on your body, and just the level of unhealthiness that that really leads to is probably equal to or at least comparable to, you know, an obese person weighing 350 pounds. And I definitely agree with that. I mean, one of the primary criticisms that professional bodybuilding gets is how unhealthy it is. Um, and I think to some extent that is certainly true. I mean, when, when guys get to a size like this, um, not only are you taking into consideration the factor of the drugs they took to get to that point, but you're also taking into consideration once they get to that point, just the sheer, you know, bodily functions that they go through of maintaining that size, how unhealthy that actually is, you know, how much harder the heart has to work to pump blood to all that extra muscle, the extra strain, you know, on the joints and ligaments. And then of course, naturally, you know, the daily discomfort that would come from having a physique that is that size, you know, comparing it to a guy that's obese, you know, the, you know, the common joke with professional bodybuilders is can that guy even wipe his own ass? And while that's kind of a funny comment to make, there's really probably a lot of truth to that. I mean, just the general discomfort of having legs like Big Rami has, thighs the size that Big Rami has, just finding clothes, um, just walking on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, his legs are probably rubbing together and chafing because they're so big. And then the question becomes, at what point is it really even worth it to get that big um, if they're not even rewarding you for that size anymore? And again, this isn't even taking into consideration the drug use that would be required to get to that size. Again, this is just talking about once you get to that size, you know, just the daily life of being a 350 pound bodybuilder. And that's why I'm a big fan of the classic physique division. Again, I think it harkens back to the old days of the 60s and 70s with the posing being better, um, the presentation being better, and the physiques being downsized, more conditioned. Um, and some people say, well, you know, the gear use in classic physique is probably still comparable to the gear use in men's open bodybuilding, which is probably true, but it's still a step in the right direction um, towards downsizing the physiques um, and getting a more aesthetic and more streamlined look to the physique, which I think is important. So people like to argue that classic physique isn't much healthier than men's open bodybuilding, 
And to some extent, from the drug use perspective, that is true. But again, it's about being a step in the right direction um, and kind of reaching the breaking point of the mass monster era. Because really, when you think about it, how much bigger can a bodybuilder get than Big Rami? A lot of people would argue that Big Rami is already too big. The legs are too big. I think, you know, personally, I think the legs are too big and throw off the physique. But could a bodybuilder really be bigger than Big Rami? Could we see a guy that's 350 pounds on stage or 400 pounds on stage or whatever the case may be? Would that even be something that should be rewarded in bodybuilding? Or would that even be something that would be pleasant to look at in any capacity, um, even remotely considered aesthetic? So at some point, there has to be a maxed out physique. There has to be a bodybuilder that is as big as a bodybuilder can get. I don't think bodybuilders can continue to get bigger than a guy like Big Rami. If we keep going on an upward trajectory and, you know, five or 10 years from now, we have a guy that's much bigger than Big Rami and he plays as well at the Olympia. Then, you know, 20 years from now, we have a guy that's even bigger than that. I don't think we can keep continuing on that uphill climb to bigger and bigger physiques relative to a guy like Big Rami. So I honestly think that 2018 was the peak of that. I think Big Rami is probably as big of a bodybuilder as we are ever going to see. I honestly believe that. Or at least he's as big of a bodybuilder as we're ever going to see placing second at the Mr. Olympia from this point forward. So I do think the shift in bodybuilding that we've seen in 2018 is a good shift. I think it's a positive shift. Um, and I think it's a healthier shift. Do I think this makes bodybuilding healthy? No. Do I think it makes it healthier? Yes. And again, that's a step in the right direction. To be totally honest, I don't think bodybuilding, professional bodybuilding at least, would ever be considered, you know, by a mainstream definition, a healthy sport, but nor do I think any other sport by a mainstream definition would be considered healthy. I mean, look at football, for example. Look at the life expectancies of some of these football players. Look at the injuries that some of these football players suffer. Look at the brain damage that some of these football players suffer. But will people continue to watch it despite it not necessarily being good for these players' health? Absolutely, because that's the nature of sports. People like to watch people do things that regular people can't do, and that's the appeal of bodybuilding. Um, it's not so much a bunch of people wanting to look like these guys. It's that people enjoy watching people do something extreme. It's that people enjoy watching people do something at the top level um, that you know regular people, again, can't do. And that's why I find professional bodybuilding so fascinating um, and really entertaining. You know, I'm a big fan of natural bodybuilding. I promote some natural bodybuilding shows. I've competed in natural bodybuilding shows. Um, and I like to promote the idea of staying natural and being a natural bodybuilder because I think if you're looking at it from a fitness or health standpoint and you still want to compete, that's the best route to go if you want to stay healthy in the long term. Um, but at the same time, a lot of these natural bodybuilders, we still enjoy watching professional bodybuilding because it's something that we can't do. Or even if it's something that we had the genetics to do or could do, we wouldn't be willing to do it. And that's, you know, that's what entertains us. And I don't really think there's anything wrong with that. And really the fact of the matter is a lot of the people that I've met, you know, at expos or at the gym or out in public that recognize me from my channel, they're all natural guys. They just enjoy the culture of bodybuilding and watching bodybuilding on a professional level, um, even though they wouldn't make that choice themselves or you know pursue the route of professional bodybuilding or ever becoming a guy like Big Rami. You know, the majority of these people have no desire to ever weigh 350 pounds. And I think it's really cool to have this bodybuilding community and this bodybuilding subculture that I think is constantly growing into a bigger and bigger culture um, and reaching a bigger and bigger audience. I mean, the longer I've had my channel, you know, the wider audience it seems these videos tend to reach and the broader the community becomes. So that's the video for today, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I've been experimenting with different types of content lately, trying to figure out what's going to work best um, for the evolution of my channel. I've been experimenting with longer videos um, because honestly, in the past, you know, the entire time I've had my channel, actually, I had no idea really how YouTube worked. I mean, this whole time I've kind of been winging it. Um, and when people are talking about making 10 minute plus videos for more revenue or for more views or whatever the case may be, I really had no idea what they were talking about because I was making videos you know, that were always five minutes or less. They're always getting a decent amount of views um, and they made a decent amount of money. But the entire time I've had my channel, I never knew how to put ads inside of a video. 
um, like in, you know, in the middle of a video. Uh, so I never really knew why these people with these 10 minute plus videos were talking about why 10 minute plus was so good um, because I would make 10 minute plus videos here and there. They'd make the exact same revenue as any other video. But recently I figured it out. So I was experimenting with different types of videos that could be longer than 10 minutes. And what I found was these videos became very popular and seemed to be recommended much, much more. I've been making these news update types of videos where I cover multiple topics in one video rather than just covering one topic at a time. And what I, what I found is these videos seem to be reaching a much larger audience than my shorter videos. I'll post one of these videos that are a news update video. It'll instantly get 100,000 views in a day, 100,000 plus. And then the next day, I'll go back to posting, you know, a five minute video, a shorter video, because a lot of you guys enjoy the short videos. And that video will do half the views or a third of the views, or even worse, you know, than a longer video. So what I'm finding is YouTube really tends to prefer the longer format of video as far as sending it out to your subscribers and recommending it. So that's why I've been experimenting with these longer style videos, because it seems to be beneficial, not just from a money standpoint, but from the standpoint of it seems to be what people want. You know, people have been asking me for longer content and this longer content has been getting way more views than my shorter content. So I'm going to continue trying to find a way, you know, to make higher quality videos that are longer that you guys can enjoy um, on a more frequent basis because people seem to like that. And the longer videos that I've done so far, have just gotten an overwhelmingly really positive response. So I really appreciate you guys that take the time to thumbs up my videos. You take the time to watch my videos as soon as I upload, you click the bell notification. Um, that's the kind of stuff that really helps out my channel and I really appreciate each and every single one of you. So again, if you have not subscribed, please subscribe to my channel. And if you're not getting my videos in your subscription box, because apparently this has been a big problem lately, make sure you have that bell notification click. That's the only recommendation I can give you. Um, you know, so many people have been asking me why they got unsubscribed from my channel, why my videos aren't showing up in their timeline. And really, I have no idea. I mean, YouTube just tends to have these issues. So just make sure you click that bell notification button if you want to see my videos and make sure you thumbs up my videos if you're enjoying the longer style of content. So thank you guys for watching the video. Nick Strength and Power, signing out.